There is a fascinating term in the world of mechanics that's getting applied everywhere in business and personal lives and self-improvement. And I'm going to apply it today to reading, especially reading philosophy. The term is a flywheel. Now, if you've never heard of a flywheel, all this is is a very large wheel, usually a very heavy metallic wheel that is really difficult to spin on its axis. It takes a lot of effort to get this thing going and pushing it. But the beauty of a flywheel is that as you lean into this thing and you really get it going and it starts to creep forward, the sheer weight of the wheel begins to create its own sort of energy. It sort of gets itself into momentum. So as, if you can imagine a really heavy wheel, as you get spinning it, it finally gets easier and easier to the point where it would actually be hard to stop it because it's so much weight revolving in a circle. A flywheel is a fascinating idea because in life we have things that are really, really hard to start hard to do. But if you put in the effort in the beginning, it begins to build up its own momentum. It's little winds stacking on top of each other that build and build and build so that this thing begins to almost run itself and give you benefit. We're going to talk about that today and how it applies to the art of reading philosophy. Welcome to this week's episode of the Read Well podcast. My name is Eddie Hood and I'm your host where I believe it's more important to read well than to be well read. So grab your favorite book, open up your notes, and let's get ready to learn something fascinating. Hey readers, welcome back. This is Eddie Hood at the Read Well Podcast. It has been a fantastic week and I'm just so excited that you're here. Last week I got a chance to start by sharing a new review on our Apple Podcast page. And we got another one just recently, so you must be listening. And I just want to thank you for taking the time to go to that page and leave us a little review. So we got another five-star review last week. This is from OB Norm, O-B-I-N-O-R-M, who said, I just discovered this podcast and I'm already hooked after the first two episodes. Love the premise of reading well versus being well-read. Obi Norm, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to leave that review. It really helps the show sort of get its own legs and it allows us to be found by more people. So thank you for doing that. It means the world to me. Hey, today we're talking about flywheels. Now, this is a fascinating topic. Again, it's something that happens in the world of mechanics and flywheels are everywhere. They're in your cars. They're in a lot of machines that just run your day-to-day -day living. And I think you'd be surprised at how common they are, but it's a really interesting topic because you can apply the analogy to really whatever you're doing in life. As I mentioned in the introduction, a flywheel is heavy. It's hard to turn by nature. It's supposed to be that way. It's big, it's cumbersome, but when you put in the initial effort, once it gets going, it's hard to stop because it's so heavy, it just kind of moves itself forward. Now, in the art of reading, where we're reading philosophy specifically, I like to talk about philosophy because it has so many benefits to it. But I want to share with you my experience in coming to an understanding of philosophy, because let's be honest, folks, reading this stuff is challenging. It's like a flywheel. You, you really have to push hard against philosophy. And at first it feels a little, you know, a little difficult, a little bit of a drudgery here. But I promise you that if you continue to push against these books and these ideas and these concepts, that they'll pick up momentum in your life and they'll start to make sense. Not only that, they'll become incredibly valuable. To get this point across, I'm going to take you back in time to 2004. It's fall and I am sitting in a general class for my college degree. I'm going to school for business to study to become an accountant. And I needed to fill a hole in my schedule in order to get my course requirements taken care of. And I thought to myself, you know, <laughs> this accounting work is pretty tough. I'm going to find a class that's easy that I can just kind of skirt through on. So I decided to sign up for intro to philosophy. Boy, was that a big mistake. Now, I'm so glad I did it because I have learned to love philosophy, but this was a tough class. I went into that class thinking, what's the big deal? We'll talk about some interesting ideas. I'll write a paper or two. Simple, right? But I remember sitting in that first lecture and as the teacher spoke, I was pretty sure she was speaking in English but I couldn't tell. I recognized the words, but how she was linking the words together into these sentences made no sense to me. And 
I walked out thinking, what just happened? Part of me was terrified. I knew this was not the level of ease I thought it was going to be. I knew I had gotten myself into deep, deep water. And I also was intrigued by the idea of this muddy mess. I thought, wow, what is going on here? And I stayed in that class. I did not drop it. And I, I did it miserable. <laughs> I did not do well in this class. But that was my first exposure to the likes of Western philosophy. So we discussed uh, everything ancient from Plato and Aristotle to more contemporary authors like uh, Hannah Arendt on totalitarianism and other ideas. It was a fantastic first experience with philosophy, but my brain was not ready for it yet, mainly because I was so focused on all my other classes and coursework and trying to get an accounting degree that I just didn't have the appropriate amount of time to sit with these ideas. And that's really what it feels like when you first begin philosophy for a lot of people, I think. It can feel very heavy, these ideas, these concepts almost weigh in your brain, and you're just not, I don't know, it, it, it's hard. But what I want to share with you is this. It is a flywheel that you're pushing against. And if you're willing to lean into that hardness and stick with these ideas, that will, that gigantic metal will, will begin to turn. And as it does, it's going to pick up momentum. Here's why this happens, because you are exposed to not only new ideas that philosophers have, but these ideas are often intangible ideas, right? They're sometimes hard to conceptualize because it's not like if I were to talk to you about a car, you could go out and sit in a car and, you know, drive it and go, yeah, I understand what a car is. This makes perfect sense. But when you read a philosopher's work, you can't really go sit in their idea. A lot of this stuff is cognitive and you really need to get good at um, putting, you know, two and two together to make a, a different picture here. So I want to give you a quick example of this. I'm going to read just one sentence out of Plato's The Republic. Now, this is not a hard sentence to understand, but I want to talk about what it means to unpack this stuff. So in Plato's book, The Republic, he is uh, writing a dialogue between his teacher Socrates and a couple different people. Uh, at this point in time, Socrates is talking to a man named Thrasymachus, and he says, this is Socrates speaking, we must now proceed to the further question which we set ourselves, whether the just live better and happier lives than the unjust. Okay, that's it. That's the sentence. So all Socrates is saying is, hey, we need to have a conversation here. Do just people live better lives than unjust people? And on the surface level, that is, you know, fairly easy to understand. I decided to pick a passage that was not overly complex. But what I wanted to point out here is that even with a passage like this, there is a lot of layering happening there. And as you begin to read more and more philosophy, you begin to see those layers and it gets more and more interesting. The first time I read that, I went, yeah, okay, that makes sense. But as you begin to study philosophy, you begin to uh, unpack terms. And just, just as an example, the word just and the word unjust is a whole branch of philosophy. And, and here we're asking, what does it mean to be just? Is just tied to your moral behavior? Is just simply doing what's best for the greater good at the sacrifice of your own self-interest? Is just simply following your cultural norms, doing what your church and your family taught you? Is being just to punish people when they steal versus not? There's just so many things here that you can unpack. And I swear we could sit down and probably have a four hour discussion on this one sentence. Now you might be going, oh goodness, this is why I don't read philosophy. <laughs> I don't have four hours to pontificate on the word just. I hear you, uh, but I'm gonna push back on that just a little bit because uh, I think I think one of the nice things about philosophy is it has its own defining attribute. You know, there are books out there that are designed to entertain you. There are books that are designed to inform you uh, on how to do a specific skill set or get better at a hobby or understand a political system or whatever your interest is. There are books out there for that. But philosophy, from what I can see on the landscape, is really the only a subset of book out there that teaches you how to think critically for yourself. It asks you to ask questions. And I can't think of any other books I've read that do that so well. So 
You could spend days just talking about this concept of what it means to be just or unjust. And yes, while that is heady, I want to get to the root of this and point out that there's a lot of value in that because the moment you interface with that idea and you begin to decide and to define what just means as you read other philosophers' ideas on the word justice and you compare it with your own beliefs, you begin to have your own worldview. You begin to think critically. Because up to that point, you'd never thought about justice. You just, you know, it's a word you'd learned when you were a child. You kind of integrated it into your language system, and then it went away, and you just, you hear it in passing. But when you start to think critically about it, it will now begin to affect and influence how you raise your kids, because justice is a part of that. Do you ground your kids when they do X or Y or Z? How are you going to interface with them when they do something that they absolutely shouldn't? There are so many ways that justice is going to come into your life. You'll think about this as an employee when you go to work. Is it unjust if I steal the stapler and bring it home because I need a stapler at home? Or uh, you know, should I help a fellow employee who's way behind on their work? but it would put me behind on my work. There's so many things that it begins to influence. And I don't mean to overwhelm you. My goal is to help you realize that even with these basic terms, there's an incredible amount of value in thinking about them for yourself. You see, we've been taught what justice means by our churches and by our governments and by our family, but when was the last time you thought, gee, you know, what do I think about this? What's my opinion? Hey everyone, I want to take just a quick second in the middle of this podcast to tell you about Highlightish.com. Think of highlighting a book, but add I-S-H at the end. Highlightish.com is the tool that I use to make better book notes and to organize my writing. It's where I go to capture my favorite passages, annotate them, and then to turn that research into essays, blog posts, or research papers. If you're someone that wants to get more out of the books that you love and you want to turn that into great output, go to Highlightish.com today. Thanks for listening and let's get back to the show. So all of this began for me in 2004. I went to the University of Utah and I got my degree. I did pass that class and I did end up getting my degree and I went on to get a master's degree in business. But that was the end of my experience with philosophy for many years. I went on to live my life and I've always been interested in these authors, but I never took the time to read them. I always felt like I wasn't smart enough, like I was below the level of thinking that was gonna be required to get into these books. And that's because of how, you know, my first experience with them went. And so I, I would kind of poke around in these in these books in the library or the bookstore, but I would never really buy them. I always just figured maybe one day, but for, for right now, I'm going to stick with, you know, whatever. And I think, oh, I don't know, uh, about a year ago, yeah, about a year ago, I started to have questions myself about my own belief systems. And I came across a video online talking about philosophy and the point behind it. And as I started to watch that video, it gave me courage and gave me permission to start exploring these things on my own. Actually, I know what it was. It was Ryan Holiday, right? You all probably know who Ryan Holiday is. He's the great gentleman who writes about Stoic philosophy. He is the king of Stoicism. And so I think a lot of us have been uh, introduced or reintroduced to philosophy through him. And I'm really quite grateful for his work. I read The Obstacle is the Way, and I read Ego is the Enemy, and several other books, and really enjoyed those because they're written in a contemporary language. They're very accessible. You can read them easily. But they present some really nice Stoic ideas. And I think Stoicism is a nice sort of gateway into this world of philosophy if you want to get there. The reason why Stoicism is so popular still today is because the value systems uh, that they taught 2,000 years ago still apply today, right? I mean, the Stoics really rely on four different key virtues, to have wisdom, to be courageous, to have justice, and to have temperance. Temperance being self-control and, you know, not, <laughs> not getting addicted to stuff, essentially, is a, maybe a great way to think about that. So I picked up The Obstacle is the Way and I read it and I loved that book. Um, and that was me pushing on the flywheel of philosophy for the first time. And again, Ryan is a really great lever to get that flywheel moving. And that led to other books. I thought, well, geez, you know, Ryan is suggesting books by Epictetus and by Seneca. So I read those and I loved them. 
And once you start reading these books, especially the Stoics, you get into the language of philosophy and it's no longer scary. It is very accessible. And so then you start to lean into other things. And uh, Plato is actually not as challenging as you might think. It's a really good stepping stone after some of these Stoic authors because Plato is writing in dialogue form, like I mentioned, uh, his teacher talking to other people about philosophical ideas. And so it's almost like reading a play. And while it can get a little thick at times, Plato's dialogues are a really nice introduction to Western philosophy. And it's been said many times that everything we know and believe about philosophy is really just a footnote to Plato's ideas. So the man had a lot to say and really was a cornerstone to this way of thinking. So another reason why reading philosophy can feel a bit heavy at times is because you're going to be exposed not only to new concepts and ideas by these philosophers, but also new terms. Philosophers are really good at coming up with words, literally creating words that explain their ideas. And they then expect you to not only understand these words, but keep track of them as they make their ideas more and more complex. So every time you come across a new word, I would encourage you to write it down and take the time to do an internet search to figure out what this word means, why it's being used, and what the philosopher is trying to accomplish with it. A great example here is Martin Heidegger, who was the German philosopher, who's most famous for his book, Being in Time, uh, uses the word Dasein, D-A-S-I-E-N. And if you've never seen that word before or heard it, uh, you'll read that and you'll be like, what the world? And then you'll just blow right past it, but you can't. This is a critical word to understanding his ideas and you need to pause and really go study that. So know that vocabulary is important and know that it's worth the time to really learn those words. Now, I'm not going to say that I am great at reading philosophy yet, but I will say this, I have gotten better at it and I am more comfortable with it. I used to sit down in a philosophical work and I could probably, <laughs> you know, put five or 10 minutes into it before my brain was just scrambled. And I was like, oh, wow, I need to put this down and go for a walk. It was a lot. And I think that that's okay. I can easily sit down now for 60 minutes uninterrupted with a book and take notes and be present with that information and make that time useful and beneficial. But that is a sort of skill that you have to build up. It, there's definitely stamina that comes with reading, especially reading philosophy, because you are doing some work here. You Again, you're pushing on that flywheel and it's going to take mental effort to get that thing moving. So this is not passive reading. It's definitely going sentence by sentence and making sure you're comfortable with it before you go on to the next sentence. So you're going to feel a little fatigued when you finish this, but if you've ever run a, a, you know, a 5K or even just ran around the block, even though it's hard and even though you're panting, you're usually glad you did it. You're usually like feeling better because you got some blood moving and you're feeling alive. Philosophy can do the same thing for you mentally. You've just learned a new concept and it's something you'd never thought of before. And although you had to kind of work to get it, right? You really had to sort of push on that flywheel. You now have a little win that you can add to your, your intellectual basket. And now you have that to get that flywheel moving faster and faster every time you begin to read. I've decided to make a section of the podcast each week dedicated to making a specific book recommendation. And I think, I'm hoping that this will become a popular part of the show where you can look forward to getting something new to read each week or a new idea. Um, these, sometimes it will be older books, sometimes it will be new, sometimes it will be fiction, sometimes it will be nonfiction, but it will always be a book that I've spent a serious amount of time with taking notes and I feel like it would be worth uh, a reader's time to really dig in. And because of the message today and where we've gone, I would like to recommend The Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday. Now this has been out for a long time. It's been in print for quite a while. And you've probably read it if you are in our community because you're already thinking about nonfiction books and philosophy and improving yourself. But even if you have read it, I would encourage you to go back and check it out. It's a nice little book and the premise is really based on the idea that in life, your best plan of action is usually towards the obstacle that is in front of 
you getting what you want. That was a really terrible explanation. Ryan, I'm sorry I just butchered your book. But really it is that if you want to, for example, make more money and start a business, the best thing you can do is not sit at your desk and think about it forever and come up with a thousand plans. The biggest obstacle is you gotta get paid to be a business owner. So what you should do is go out and find a customer. You should start knocking on doors and see if anybody's gonna buy your product or service. If you can get somebody to say yes, then you've got a feasible business model and you might as well build a business plan at that point because you know that there's something to this. That big obstacle, the worst possible part, that's usually what you should do in order to get where you wanna go. The Obstacle is the Way is definitely a book that changed my life. It made me think of my hardships in a positive light. It made me really appreciate the idea of doing hard things and embracing the challenge. So if that sounds of interest to you, uh, go check it out. As you know, or maybe you don't know, I'm a big fan of supporting local bookstores. In fact, if you go to the readwellpodcast.com, there's a section in my in the navigation that says bookstores, and that is a list of local bookstores that you can go to to buy your books. I am a big fan of doing that versus shopping on Amazon or Barnes & Noble if at all possible. We're up to 26 bookstores right now, and all of those stores are coming from you. So if you have your local favorite and you want me to add that to the list, simply go to that page and there's a little form you can fill out. You'll just put in the bookstore's name and their information and we'll get it added for you. Hey, if you found this episode helpful, I want to thank you for taking a moment to listen and I have a quick challenge for you. So if you have been trying to find a way in your life to become a better reader or you are just simply interested in uh, meeting other people that love to read this kind of stuff, Go over to thereadwellpodcast.com and then up in the navigation, there's a button that says community. That's my private reading community. You can create a free account there where you will have access to some live events and to a lot of chat options to talk about books and get book recommendations. And then if you're interested as well, you can become a premium member. Right now it's $15 a month. And if you do that, you'll have access to our live book club, which I host every week, as well as some reading challenges like my 30-day focused reader challenge and so on. Uh, it has been a fantastic place to uh, really get away from the pole of social media and instead spend time with people who care about what we care about, right? It's nice to find your people. So until next week, thank you so much for listening. And as always, remember to read slowly, take notes, and apply the ideas. All right, everybody. I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to take your reading to the next level, then head on over to our website at thereadwellpodcast.com. There you can get access to my weekly newsletter as well as up-to-date show information. Also, don't forget that I learned software development on the side just so that I could build a program to help us make better book notes as we read. If you're interested, go to highlightish.com. Think of highlighting a book, but add ish, I-S-H, at the end. Highlightish.com. Thanks for listening, everyone, and we'll see you on the next show.